Hello, bounty hunters, and welcome to the Bebop. Today we'll be taking a dive into one of the most popular anime of all time, Cowboy Bebop. I uh, wanted to do a thing like the bounty hunter show for this, but I didn't want to do drag or blackface, so... Neo-Noir Space Western has been one of the most popular anime in the West, particularly America, for decades. Airing on Cartoon Network's Adult Swim Block in 2001, Bebop instantly received acclaim, especially in the West. Unsurprisingly, due to Shinichiro Watanabe, the series director, being a bit of an Amerabu. You could call me Wyatt Earp. Cowboy Bebop has always been more popular in America than in Japan, pound for pound at least, it is still an anime. In contrast to most anime which typically take their inspiration from Eastern sources, say Journey to the West for Dragon Ball or even Bleach for Chainsaw Man, but Cowboy Bebop draws just as much from the West as it does from the East. Noir films, westerns, even Halloween specials, trucker culture, and old war movies flavor the world or worlds of Cowboy Bebop with some of the best bell peppers and beef flavor you could ask for. Cowboy Bebop is one of the most widely praised anime of all time, with every media arm from fully produced TV specials to commentary YouTube channels getting their chance to suck the soul out of the show. And you know what? My turn, assholes! Spike Spiegel is a character who needs no introduction. That doesn't include me saying something insanely cool while smoking a cigarette. Calm, cool, collected, and luckily unclaimed by the Sigma male diaspora of the internet. Spike as a character represents a lot of what Bebop is. He's fun, but with an air of sadness. A man of many worlds who is at the same time world-weary. But he isn't just the lackadaisical gunslinger that his famous catchphrase may portray him as. Are you for real? We can't live oh, without well. them. I knew I Whatever should happens, I'm happens. I don't wanna die yet. He cares a lot about the people around him, whether they be his fellow crew on the Bebop or some poor saps on Venus. He's also voiced by Steve Blum, one of the most accomplished Western voice actors of all time, from Orochimaru to Wolverine to Killer Croc in Batman Arkham Knight. Blum makes Spike mysterious, longing, and absolutely hilarious. Take a look. Do I really look like I have money? Spike exists in a weird place, in a weird time, with terrorist sea rats and evil spoiled lobster but he approaches each of his insane adventures with the same carefree, gunslinging attitude. A little less carefree if the adventure involves a beautiful woman. Like the spirits of ghost adventures, Spike's past comes back not just to haunt him, but to kick his ass. The various crime syndicates are a solid, overarching-ish villain, and his fights with Vicious are... yeah, that. And Spike Spiegel is unsurprisingly one of the best parts of Cowboy Bebop. This is a bit random, but one of the best things about Cowboy Bebop is the iconic visuals, especially the color palette. Cowboy Bebop is especially fond of the blues. Sorry for the misdirection, but Cowboy Bebop has a legendary soundtrack. The jazzy opening Tank, which is so recognizable that Overwatch only needed a few seconds of it to eventually disappoint everyone. Which I mean, the real disappointment was no teddy bear bomber skin for Junkrat. I mean, come on, we all know that. Come on. The music for the series was composed by Yoko Kano, founder of the jazz and blues band Seatbelts. Cowboy Bebop feels like an absolute miracle of collaboration, not a single element of it lives in isolation. It's as simple as the way that the music from Kana weaves throughout every other element of the story. Like how one of my favorite songs on the soundtrack, Elm, supports the somber resignation of Jet Black. I'll take care of this. You can go back. You're not gonna let him get away, are you? When I was a cop, this was my beat. I'm the black dog, and when I bite, I don't let go. 
I have no regrets about her, but I'll settle this score on my own turf. Justice and duty, huh? All right. Jet Black, cop turned bounty hunter, which is like the biggest glow up of all time, is the most understated character on the Bebop. A kind, even sensitive man with a past that he seems to long for. A life when he thought the lines between right and wrong were more clear. But while the trappings of that old life, friends and lovers need to be left behind, the ideals that Jet has cultivated within himself are what keep him going. Constantly pruning himself. Like his bonsai trees. He's a lot better than the Netflix one too. Sounds to me like blackmail. No, it doesn't. Let's move on. Hot girls, we have problems too. We're just like you, except we're hot. Faye Valentine might just be my favorite character on the show, but she's definitely my girlfriend's favorite. The contrasting femme fatale to Spike Spiegel's gunslinging guy. Faye is by far the least reliable member of the Bebop, coming and going from the ship as she pleases. I can't be stuck in one place for long. It'll kill me. My whole family's like that. Yeah, right. We're Romanies. For eons, we've wandered the stars looking for love. It's our way. Huh? Man, it's kind of crazy that she didn't say a slur there. Good for them. It's really impressive how much impact the characters of Cowboy Bebop can have even when they get shockingly little screen time. When Faye shows up for the first time in Session 3, Honky Tonk Women, for a cosmic casino heist, you know this chick is out of this world. Fuck man, I'm so nervous. She's so pretty. But Faye isn't just a sexy action woman. Like Spike and Jet, she longs for a past she can never return to, always resigned to an infinite present. A present where even if she wants to be the worst, most selfish person she can be, she can't help but express kindness, like with the mysterious Gren. What the Bebop really is, is a wayward home for people who are still figuring out what their history means to them. And no matter how many times they run from their lives, the Bebop is always there to be a home for somber travelers. <laughs> she promised Ed that Ed could become a real member of Bebop. Radical Edward, the legendary 4-6 hacker from the ruined planet of Earth, is the kiddo of the Bebop. She's voiced by Melissa Fawn, and she always makes sure that his... Wait, hold on. Oh, that's different. Thanks for taking care of my son. Hmm, or uh, was it my daughter? You may think that Edward is a boy, as did I, you bigoted piece of shit, but the characters refer to Ed as a girl and use she, her, so I'm doing that one. Ed is another iconic Bebop character who has shockingly little screen time, but the way she gets around a fight, by hacking and hijacking police ships, even chatting with a long-abandoned satellite is incredibly refreshing. Ed has the ability to make friends with the oddest of people, being a little odd herself, like the geriatric Chessmaster Hex. Episodes like The Pursuit of Chessmaster Hex in Bohemian Rhapsody may not be the most famous, but they're some of my favorites. Insert queen joke here. Cowboy Bebop is a truly special project for a lot of reasons. Not only is it on a higher level a love letter to multiple forms of art across multiple cultures and time periods, a super group of creators who brought together musical prowess, character ship, and weapon designs I could chew on, plus Watanabe using a Tarantino amount of loving homage, except better and without the foot fetish shit. It makes his movies worse, he needs to stop it. Or be stopped. But it's also special on a much more identifiable level due to maybe being the most popular anime ever made not based on a manga. I always like to end a little series retrospective like this talking about some of my favorite episodes, especially the ones I don't hear talked about as much, so let's go! You know, I thought that dry firing this thing would be a cool way to kind of do the bounty hunter show thing i was gonna use these uh these nerf guns i have but i can't find them and then i remembered that youtube probably doesn't like the idea of me shooting a weapon into the camera for part of my my silly little video 
So honestly, this really bummed me out, and uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing because of it. Session 4, Gateway Shuffle, is an episode that I absolutely, top to bottom, just love. The Ganymede Sea Rats are a fantastic piece of world building, not just from their namesake and motivation, but the ultimate axe they hang over the solar system, Monkey Business. Monkey Business, the DNA-altering virus like Spike's famous ship, the Swordfish 2, is a fantastic example of the instantly iconic names of Cowboy Bebop. Gateway Shuffle is also maybe the most overt example of Cowboy Bebop's proud anti-corporate sentiment. With the Ganymede Sea Rats going on a revenge tear against environmental criminals, they're a little hard not to root for. Sometimes. And the insanely pulse-pounding climax is just incredible. Gateway Shuffle is the beginning of a three-peat reminiscent of the... Montreal Canadiens. Jesus Christ, look at that guy. Looks like part of the Sawyer family. Ballad of Fallen Angels is a legendary episode, with the first major appearance of Vicious, who is a fantastically intimidating villain. He has a katana, a super scary bird, and him and Spike have the coolest dialogue ever written. You should see yourself. You have any idea what you look like right at this moment, Spike? What? A ravenous beast. The same blood runs through both of us. The blood of a beast who wanders. The same blood God, they want to make out so badly. But that is the last time I'll be bringing his name up. You need to say Candyman five times and Beetlejuice three, so I'm kind of fucking scared. Session five, Sympathy for the Devil, is a mystery that slowly unravels with a fantastic jazz soundtrack and a climax that not only delves into high sci-fi concepts and classic mob stories, but leaves off with an unforgettable duel. Session 11, Toys in the Attic, is a hilariously fun episode. It gives me the vibe of a classic Halloween special, and is a great palate cleanser after Jet's somber Ganymede elegy in Session 10. One of my favorite aspects of Cowboy Bebop's world building is the relationship between their analog technology and life after death. In Ed's introductory episode, Jammin' with Edward, a rogue satellite draws carvings of animals into the earth, reminiscent of Native American art long after it was meant to be lost. But my favorite example of how Bebop uses this theme is the scarily peaceful cult Scratch, which worships the holy religion of television, all led unwittingly from the hospital bed of a child. This tie between the more tactile, bygone era of technology that Cowboy Bebop emulates and the afterlife is also present in the J-horror of the era, like Ring. In a similar way, Session 18, Speak Like a Child, sees the Bebop crew try to uncover a mystery surrounding a beta tape. But the outstanding technology of their future, DVD, has made it a near impossibility to solve. Speaking of technology, I am not unique or special for enjoying the flashy, digitally colored Poirot La Fou, which kills me. I need to be special. But the horrific Tong Poo from Session 20 is just too good to ignore. The dark palette with flashes of incredibly bright color in the third act was actually inspired by the animation style for Batman the Animated Series. I could go through every single episode of this groundbreaking, timeline-altering animated series and I would be happy to do it. But I would love to talk about Cowboy Bebop again, so I just wanted to leave enough on the table for me to return to. Just maybe after a few more watch-throughs. Thank you for joining us, Space Cowboys, and I hope I demonstrated why Cowboy Bebop is, now, and forever will be, the GOAT. But that is the video for this week, y'all. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching that video as always. If you made it to this point a special double thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to show off my uh, collection thing really quick this week because I have something cool to talk about after. This is the uh, vol <laughs> manga volume number one for uh, Kaiju number eight. Uh, the anime of this is starting this April, uh, this month. So yeah, just wanted to show that off really quick. But the main thing I have to talk about is... so. We got to a thousand subscribers on Casual Classroom. Thank you so much, all of you. It is just wonderful.
but I'm tightening things up a little bit. Uh, so first thing, gonna do a uh, once a month like members slash Patreon video. Uh, they are gonna have a uh, wide range of stuff. Uh, and what we are doing first, I'm really excited about this, is the uh, somewhat famous, more so infamous if anything, 1992 Halloween documentary special that aired on the BBC for one night only, Ghost Watch. Uh, if you know what that is, cool. If you don't know what it is, go watch it. Uh, it's awesome. I love it. Uh, I'll see y'all next time. Goodbye.